Good evening, council members and city staff and members of the public. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Susan McLean and I'm the community development director. I'm joined by Alex Hunt, who is the star of this presentation tonight. He is a planner with the Department of Community Development. Um, we've been working with people up and down the Ambaum Corridor and in Boulevard Park. We've had um, numerous meetings in the community to talk about the future of these neighborhoods. Um, part of the neighborhoods were incorporated a little bit later in Burien's history. And so part of this effort is looking at the quality of the neighborhoods. And also, as I think a lot of people pointed out today, um, looking at how the city can achieve some of its goals in terms of um, providing housing at uh, a diversity of housing types um, and contributing to some of the um, region's environmental goals in terms of uh, TOD, um, affordability, um, in new investment in areas where it's appropriate, that kind of thing. So we just wanted to um, begin our conversation with you that we hope takes place over the next six to eight to nine months about, um, about the future of, of Ambaum and Boulevard Park, including land use decisions. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Susan. And again, for the record, I'm Alex Hunt uh, with the Community Development Department. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So just an overview on what we're going to be discussing tonight, I'll uh, give you a brief update on the community engagement that we've done to date for this plan. I'll give you an introduction to the draft documents, uh, the sub area plan for Ambaum and Boulevard Park, <clears throat> as well as the environmental impact statement. I'll let you know about some of the land use alternatives and potential zoning that will uh, come out of this draft planning effort. And then I'll open it up for discussion with council and address any questions you have. Uh, next slide, please. So just to, to reorient us to this community planning effort, uh, since it's been a while since I've spoken with you all about this, uh, this is a sub area plan for two different neighborhoods, two different sub areas, the Ambaum Corridor and Boulevard Park. Uh, the Ambaum Corridor is the future home of the Rapid Ride H line uh, and Boulevard Park was uh, annexed in 2010 uh, and council originally uh, started up this planning effort as a way to kind of get investment back into that neighborhood. Uh, so throughout this process, we have uh, done a lot of community engagement with the diverse communities here, uh, done our best to work with as many people as we can to articulate a community vision uh, and develop strategies as part of this planning effort. Uh, and then thinking about how we leverage transit improvements, especially along Ambaum to get some of that transit oriented development uh, and walkable uh, business districts and vibrant business districts here in these two sub areas. Uh, and then from that vision, uh, setting the stage for the next 20 years of these neighborhoods through recommended land use and zoning changes, which would change uh, land use regulation in these neighborhoods. Uh, and then throughout the work, uh, applying a race and social equity lens uh, in line with the comprehensive plan equity elements. Next slide, please. So just a quick reminder of how the equity framework factors into the Ambaum and Boulevard Park plans. Uh, in the engagement stage, uh, our focus was to kind of prioritize, put extra energy into reaching folks who uh, stand to be most impacted by the plan, but who typically wield uh, less influence in civic processes or planning efforts who um, aren't typically reached. Uh, and then in the evaluation of proposals is uh, the other place where the equity framework comes into play. So that's thinking about uh, looking at each proposal and answering a set of questions on, does this provide access uh, to folks? And on the other side, does it create burdens uh, as listed below, cost burdens, uh, displacement burdens, um, air quality and noise impacts, things like that. Uh, next slide, please. And then just a quick summary of some of the engagement that we've done to date. We started off with a number of informal conversations, just trying to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks in the community, uh, be it through Zoom uh, meetings or, or phone calls, just to kind of understand assets and opportunities and vision here. Uh, we attended the Boulevard Park block party and talked to folks there. We launched an online interactive map tool back in uh, 2021. Uh, we've 
stood up uh, an advisory group made up of residents, business owners, uh, Burien and board and commission members, uh, nonprofit housing providers, uh, and we have just finished up our third advisory group meeting with them a few weeks ago. We have focused engagement aimed at reaching some of those uh, groups that, as I mentioned, uh, typically aren't reached. So uh, met with groups of renters, met with a youth group out of the alcove apartments, uh, held a number of uh, visioning sessions in Spanish with some of these groups as well. Uh, and then we have been working with Burien boards and commissions to uh, give them briefings and updates and solicit their feedback. We've had a number of in-person workshops uh, in spring of last year to, to have our first kind of in-person, just out in the neighborhood visioning sessions with folks. Uh, had a community scoping meeting in July to kick off the environmental impact statement process. And then we just concluded our draft plan review uh, and our, our comment uh, period just ended. We got uh, a good number of, of comments through that as well. So um, just wanted to, again, remind you of, of some of the engagement that we've done. Next slide, please. And just to introduce you to the, the draft plan here. Um, so there are a number of proposals or draft strategies that we're recommending based on what we've heard. And those uh, recommendations can be broken down into these three kind of key concepts. One, strengthening ties to place. Two, safer and healthier communities. And three, growing with intention. So all of the proposals you find in the draft plan can be uh, grouped under these three key concepts. So I'll give you some examples of, of some of the proposals coming out of this plan. Next slide, please. So strengthening ties to place, we heard a lot about people wanting to feel connected to their communities through community events, uh, investment in places where the community can gather. Uh, people love their businesses, uh, love small businesses and Ambom and Boulevard Park. So supporting businesses to alleviate displacement pressures, uh, thinking about land use regulations and zoning to encourage walkable neighborhoods. Um, part of that uh, you know, adding sidewalks in strategic locations to support that walkability, and then opportunities for public art as well. Uh, next slide, please. Safer and healthier communities. Again, a lot of that is improving access, uh, making it easier to walk, bike, and roll uh, through your neighborhoods and in Ambom and Boulevard Park. Uh, and then thinking back to uh, what Dr. Johnson was saying about air quality and noise impacts, uh, oh. thinking about the types of uses that we want to foster or promote in uh, areas that are impacted by air and noise pollution, especially Boulevard Park under the flight path there. Uh, implementing active transportation improvements, so that can be things like bicycle improvements, for example, uh, an idea that was floated was an 8th Avenue Southwest bikeway as an alternative north-south connection uh, to get bikers from off of Ambom to a, a safer lower speed roadway. Uh, and then increasing food access in Boulevard Park is another example here. Uh, and that's something we heard uh, a lot in our, in our outreach in Boulevard Park uh, after they lost the thriftway a few years ago. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, that last key concept, growing with intention, that's tied to a lot of the, the land use proposals that are coming out of this plan. So thinking about how we, uh, uh, new zoning for, for multifamily, different types of, of housing and commercial, uh, residential density and those supportive services and businesses in transit oriented development areas. So uh, leveraging rapid ride H line improvement and thinking about how do we uh, create land use regulations that uh, are supported by uh, high capacity transit design standards uh, that uh, consider the relationship between buildings and the public streets. So storefronts, things like that, again, to support the walkability of these neighborhoods. And then thinking about getting the right mix of affordability. So expanding our multifamily tax exemption program uh, to incentivize affordable housing in these two neighborhoods so that we are getting the, uh, you know, affordability levels that we know we need. Uh, and then this last one, providing additional stormwater detention facilities, looking at the kind of the environmental side uh, to reduce high flows and reduce erosion uh, as we see new development, making sure we're not having uh, negative impacts to our stormwater systems. Next slide, please. Uh, so that was the 
sub area plan document kind of high level overview of the proposals. I'll briefly touch on the environmental impact statement as well, uh, also known as an EIS. This is a document that analyzes the probable environmental impacts of a proposed action. In this case, the proposed action is the Ambaum and Boulevard Park Plan. Uh, so based on our community engagement, we developed uh, two action alternatives, and those are the alternatives that you saw uh, presented in the sub area plan and the environmental impact statement uh, that kind of look like zoning maps. Uh, and that's kind of the basis for analysis in the environmental impact statement. So we're using those proposed kind of land use scenarios to analyze environmental impacts uh, from another number of different elements uh, in the environmental impact statement. Uh, so this process allows for public input on the environmental analysis uh, and then any upfront environmental analysis that we do now, uh, it allows future development to kind of be streamlined from that aspect so that uh, individual projects don't have to go through their own environmental impact statement process, which can be uh, timely and expensive and, and really inhibit uh, development. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just kind of an example of how the EIS process works. Uh, the EIS identifies potential impacts, and if impacts are likely based on that analysis, the EIS identifies potential mitigation measures. So you're, you're basically identifying documenting impacts and then proposing mitigation measures to mitigate said impacts. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, I'll get into some of those alternatives that I mentioned. This is kind of the, the draft framework that we're using to lay out the land use alternatives in the EIS. So we've got four kind of draft new zones here, the mixed use high, mixed use low, residential high and residential medium. Uh, and each of those draft zones has different dimensional standards and allowed uses. So kind of different height limits uh, and uh, different uses allowed. So mixed use high would be up to six to eight stories. Uh, mixed use low would be, I think, a base of three with up to five if you incorporate uh, office or other commercial uses. Residential high would be that six to seven story category at the, the six to seven stories at the highest. And then residential medium is a maximum of three to four stories. Uh, so just kind of prepping you for what our draft zones are here. Next slide, please. And then here we see those uh, zones mapped in our alternative two and alternative three. And uh, one thing that I didn't mention is in an environmental impact statement, you're analyzing your alternatives, and then you also have to analyze your no action alternative, analyze environmental conditions as if we were taking no action here. So alternative one is no action, alternative two and three are our action alternatives. So uh, alternative two is the left map, uh, AMBOM is shown here. And the idea there is that we focused uh, changes to zoning along the corridor, closer in on the corridor. And that was uh, focused more, yeah, like I said, along the corridor and at uh, more of that mixed use low zone and um, existing business retention was kind of a focus there. And then alternative three was our expansive alternative. We got more ambitious with that one and expanded further off of the corridor. Uh, and you see more residential high and mixed use high in that scenario. And both action alternatives are going to incorporate anti-displacement programs, uh, transportation improvements, uh, street tree requirements and opportunities for city investment as well. Next slide, please. Now taking a look at the alternatives in AMBOM, again, that left map is alternative two with the focused intent. And then that right is alternative three, the expansive intent. Uh, the focused again, kind of limits zoning closer to existing commercial cores and the expansive uh, expands outwards with, with potential changes to zoning. And then you'll also note in alternative three, uh, that there is some residential medium around Hilltop Park as well. And then again, just to, to remind people that uh, there are air quality and noise impacts in this neighborhood 
uh, and we we heard about that in Dr. Johnson's presentation as well. So just something to consider. Uh, next slide, please. And then I also want to talk about housing affordability. We'll we'll go into more detail on this, I think, in, in future discussions. Just wanted to uh, mention that this is something that we're considering and thinking about how we want to approach this, because there are different options on how you approach providing affordable housing with uh, new zoning. So I wanted to give you kind of the some of the strategies we're thinking about and some of the benefits and drawbacks of those. So the first one there is required inclusionary housing, which basically means that any new multifamily development uh, would be required to provide a certain percentage of uh, affordable housing. Uh, the benefit there is, of course, that you're able to establish and set the affordable units with any new development. The drawback there is that it often makes uh, development not feasible. So if you're uh, wanting to provide more housing, you can actually, uh, this can have the unintended consequence of preventing uh, new housing altogether. Uh, there's the multifamily tax exemption, which I brought up earlier. Uh, that provides a tax incentive to developers who are willing to provide affordable units uh, in new development. Uh, so that tax incentive often makes it more feasible, more doable for developers to, to build those affordable units. Uh, the drawback there is that you can sometimes see uh, reductions in tax revenue to the city, although we've been told that that's uh, nominal. Uh, there are also development bonuses where you're offering uh, development incentives like height increase or reduced parking requirements uh, in exchange for a developer for providing a certain percentage of affordable units. Again, uh, you're providing a direct incentive for affordable units, and that often makes it more feasible for those affordable units to be developed. The drawback there is that the economics of that can be kind of tricky and uh, hard to nail down. Like if you get the right fit for development bonus, uh, when your economics change or your market changes, you can um, start to see your, your bonuses not work as well anymore. So it's kind of a hard thing to nail down. So I just wanted to introduce that and I would welcome feedback if people have, if the council has thoughts on uh, strategies for housing affordability. Uh, next slide, please. And then 2023 timeline, just to let you know where we're at and where we're headed. Uh, our comment period for the draft plan and EIS just ended last Friday. Uh, in March, we're gonna be meeting with our uh, advisory group one last time. And then we will be uh, introducing the sub area plan to go through the legislative process with planning commission and then with you all. And then hopefully we'll have that adopted uh, in June. And then a few months after that, we'll uh, look at adopting the associated planned action and rezone. Next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to address any questions the council has. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you for this great presentation um, and all the work that's gone into this so far. Uh, I think I'm gonna repeat a couple things that Susan is well aware of my, of my fandom with some of these things, but I'll, I'll just um, say it again to ensure that it makes it into this final proposal. I'd, I would personally love to see a um, as broad as possible implementation of the MFTE. I think there is absolutely no reason to uh, ensure that we have the most robust um, opportunity for uh, developers to utilize this great tool um, to expand affordable housing in, in the city of Buren across, across um, all spectrums of it. So that's number, that's number one. Um, number two, I was just thinking more about sort of the character of these neighborhoods and the, the transit zones and how Ambom is much more of a corridor that connects White Center and West Seattle and how Boulevard Park is much more connected to Des Moines Memorial, Military Road and 99. And I'm wondering as well as sort of its, its proximity to a lot of the areas where people do, uh, where businesses do manufacturing in Burien. And is there ways to incorporate insurances that semi-trucks and large trucks and uh, manufacturing mobility is not directly going through neighborhoods? Just the other day, I was driving through Boulevard Park and I saw semi-trucks um, cruising through 
didn't seem like they needed to be going through Boulevard Park because we have 518 and 99 and 509 right there. So um, also, I guess, I guess also on AMBOM, you know, understanding where um, we have our uh, semi trucks that are going, that are presumably going to NERA or some other places um, stick to the the transit corridors that they should be sticking to and, and to reduce noise and reduce pollution in some of these neighborhoods. That's, that's, that's the second point. Um, I'm personally in favor of the more expansive option um, across in both in both the area plans. I think that we as a city have one of the best tools to ensure that we are building uh, high dense affordable housing and that's zoning. And I think that we in Burien we've been pretty um, pretty close to the front end of this in in the region of making sure that we are attracting affordable housing and um, unique options and trying some trying innovative things. And I think that this is this is proposing a a really solid future for um, where we want to see smart growth and smart development. So I'm in favor of the third option. This is just a quick um, question I had. Has there been any communication with um, Rainier Golf Course about what what they think about that about that um, sub area plan around um, Boulevard Park because they have a huge piece of property there as you see on the map and um, I'm just curious if there's been any communication with with the golf course and um, if they've come and offered thoughts. Yeah, we've spoken with them um, about their future plans for retaining the golf course uh, and mentioned this planning effort. They didn't have a lot to say one way or the other at the time that we spoke to them about uh, kind of the direction we were headed with the plan. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Member Mora, then Council Member Sarah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, high density apartments don't always equal affordable housing just because we have more apartments doesn't make it more affordable um, one personal example for myself is my family could never afford to live in a different apartment or a different house in Burien just because we make under 50 percent AMI it's not affordable to, for us to stay in Burien we just got very lucky about where we're renting um, so I've would caution um, how we move forward with this, um, especially since there's a lot of families that live in these areas. Uh, one example for myself, we needed to find a temporary housing. We are a family of seven now. And we found a three bedroom apartment that we could rent. Um, the only downside was their cap was six people and they would not allow even a baby, a newborn. So that kind of sucked for us. Um, so I would be interested to hear of the people or anyone, I guess, who would be potentially building these apartments, what they would be allowing for apartment sizes and the amount of people that live would be allowed to live in there. Um, but definitely be cautious of as we're going forward with this and keep in mind the families that are currently in Burien are families. They're not two single, you know, adults. Um, that I feel like would be more attracted to live in a, apartment complexes versus um, the houses that they're already um, currently living living in. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I I want to start by talking a little bit about Boulevard Park, and um, it's I, I I I all things being equal, I would support the so the three option three, but all things not being equal, Boulevard Park's a little bit of a hot mess with the airport going over it and the, the, the um, ultra fine particles that we just learned about and the noise um, it, in addition to a lot of infrastructure issues with um, some, of, some of the things on the area that I was looking at on, on option three are still on um, septic systems and um, I think putting, if there's a plan that puts the cost of that on the developer, I'm very concerned that that's going to price people out of being able to live there. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't know who you would, who else it would be on. But if if somebody's paying those additional costs, it's going to get passed on to 
the the people living in that area. A lot of residents in Boulevard Park are renters because the people who originally owned the property moved somewhere else but couldn't sell the house and rent it. And so there's a lot of kind of people living in Boulevard Park where that that is their price point. And I'm very concerned about that price point being lost in this. Mm -hmm. So the, those would be my thoughts on on Boulevard Park. I think the the language around the the infrastructure and the environmental needs needs to be strong enough that those issues have to be addressed in order for growth to happen. And we obviously can't address it by making all the airplanes go somewhere else, but can can the housing be, can it have the kind of air filtration that's needed? And as the proud owner of a HIPAA filter, that's a lot of maintenance. So is there, you know, if it's not maintained, there's health issues involved in not maintaining your HIPAA filter. I want to make sure we think that neighborhood through, um, especially if we're seeing it as absorbing a large amount of Burien's population when there's known health issues that we're saying we want a large part of our population moving into. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the, when you, we looked at these two dimensional maps, a lot of the density is around the major thoroughfares. I think that makes sense. Um, I'm just curious about what strategy, you had three strategies, what strategy would Connect be under? Is that just the MFTE or was it a combination of dedicated and MFTE? Sorry, can you repeat that? So for the Connect project, if we, if we were to put it in one of the strategies, which one would it be? Like in a in one of the zoning categories? Well, you had a affordability, housing affordability chart, yeah, and there was, in the middle was the multifamily tax exemption. Yeah. Okay. So so MFTE at an 80% area median income, that's the affordability level that Connect uh, okay. was developed under. Is that... What you're yeah, asking. not that I would build a necessarily build another connect in that, but I just wanted to see, you know, what model were they following? Um, and it seemed like, you know, one thing to consider is that mixed income in in these buildings, which I um, I appreciate. Um, the other pieces, well, a couple of pieces. I agree with Councilmember Sarah around. We do have the ability to be thoughtful. I think of building requirements when we know. Um, certain residences may be exposed to things differently. So I think Boulevard Park is different from Ambom in many ways. Um, I'd like to hear more about the equity lens because I feel like I saw it in the bicycle lane, but would like to hear more about what, how else does that manifest in a plan like this? Um, there might be just more details I didn't hear or. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. So the idea behind the draft was really try to represent everything that we heard during our engagement. And the equity framework is going to come between the draft and the final, where we are going to represent kind of strategy prioritization and use the equity framework okay. to kind of set those priority priorities and justify, you know, answer those questions like, are we increasing access? Here, are we creating cost burdens and displacement pressures here uh, to kind of use that as a way to prioritize? Okay. All right, thank you. That's helpful. Any other questions? Oh, Council Member Sarah. Sorry, I have more questions. Um, I have a, a few questions about the AMBAM um, section as well. Uh, the first one has to do with sort of, act, so you're creating this, I, it sounds like walkable and mixed use corridor. Um, I'm I'm slightly concerned about walkability into that corridor from the adjacent neighborhoods. How easy is it to get to the walkable Ambaum from different areas? And, and that's a concern I have for Boulevard Park as well, is that you have a lot of 
adjacent streets that don't have sidewalks that have maybe are narrow streets and don't have sidewalks or it's unclear whether it's okay to park here or you should be driving here or you can walk here and I, I think that those are questions that I'd like to feel that we knew an answer for as those main corridors were being built up and the other question is more something because I know people spoke earlier and they've been waiting to hear this conversation. I think one question people have is what is a timeline after, so after all the community engagement, after the follow-up from this and, and once it becomes, whatever version of it is adopted, what's the timeline of actually construction happening after that? Is it, are there people waiting in line or is it, okay, now it's been approved eventually building will happen? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's it's the latter. So when we're talking about rezoning, we're talking about changing the regulations of what you can build and how large you can build it on your property. We haven't been talking with any uh, specific development uh, along that AMBOM corridor for new development. Uh, it's, it's, there's no you know guaranteed construction that's going to happen. Um, we're not lining this up for like immediate growth. This is kind of laying the groundwork for as the city grows and changes. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we won't see all of these properties that are rezoned develop in the next 20 years. Um, so this is just the change of regulation. Um, that hasn't really changed since we adopted in 1993. And is there a process whereby if if my property has been rezoned or the block over has been rezoned, where where I find that out? Uh, yeah, so when we actually get to a spot where we know the formal boundaries of zoning, uh, we're working with our communications team to make sure that people do know um yeah and then you know there have uh been potential gaps in in communication and we want to make sure that when rezoning actually does occur everyone kind of understands what's happening and and can work together to to weigh in and, and be part of the process council member mora thank you you actually reminded me of something um I think it's very important that we also talk to the people that would be the landlords of those properties or um, the owners of those properties um, to kind of see what um, issues or struggles they're having currently being landlords in Burien. I think it's very important that we take into consideration the people that are providing the housing currently in Burien. Thank you, Council Member Mora. Okay, well, thank you for that presentation and looking forward to an update in the next phase.